Good morning. Welcome on this rainy Sunday to our gathering of Southside Baptist. Uh, so good that we are here today to worship our Lord. Um, I hope I, I, I hope that we uh, that we we seek to worship the Lord all throughout the week because when we do, that just means that when we gather together, we're ready to worship. It's hard. It's, I'd say it's impossible to not seek to worship the Lord throughout the week and then expect that we could come in and just flip a switch <laughs> and and all of a sudden be in a in a in a mode of worshiping the Lord. Worship is something that happens that has to happen twenty four seven. But I always just like to think, and I've thought this for years, I always just like to, to think about all these individuals worshiping God and having as much worship as an, one individual can muster uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But then all of those individuals coming together a Sunday morning and, and this, this magnificent uh, uh, shout of praise and amount of worship to the Lord as, as people who've been worshiping all throughout the week just come together, kind of like a little small bolts of electricity, all of a sudden you put them together and you just have this, uh, this, this boom, right, this, this, uh, this huge uh, amount of worship to the Lord. Um, and uh, I can't turn to a chapter or a verse in the Bible that says that. I just, in my mind, I just, I just think about that and it gets me excited about gathering together with the church to worship. And so I hope that you are glad to be here uh, today. And it's because of Jesus that we're here. It's because of Jesus that we worship, uh, that we're able to worship. Um, and, and even God the Father has said that it is the name of the Son that is to be exalted. That it is, it is the name of the Son that is the name that is above every name. That it is the name of the Son, uh, which is the only name whereby people must be saved. And so the Father says, give all glory, honor, and praise to the Son who has come to the earth, who has defeated death by dying and then rising from the grave, who has accomplished everything. God's grand plan of salvation and who now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God and who one day will return, who will finish what he started in, in finally destroying Satan, who he has already defeated and will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the nations will worship that Jesus, King Jesus around the throne. And so that, <laughs> that is why we are able to worship. That is why we want to worship the Lord today and every day of our lives. And uh, so before I start preaching a sermon that I didn't prepare to preach today, I better move along uh, with our uh, worship service. I hope you saw the announcements on the screen um, as you were sitting there. I'm not going to repeat those today. Um, right now, if you have any questions about those, let me know after the service. I'll be glad to uh, try to answer any of those that you may have. Um, I, I want us to go to the Lord right now. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. And as I pray, I invite you to pray in your heart. And let's ask the Lord to give us hearts of worship today. Today, Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and we're grateful, uh, Lord, for the gospel, which, which we, just, we just summarized, Lord, um, which we just spent just a moment meditating upon the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, the good news that anyone... Anyone across this entire planet who trusts in Jesus Christ for salvation will be saved 100% completely from their sin. Father, the work of salvation is finished. Just as Christ cried out on the cross, it is finished, Lord. Your work of salvation, what you need to do is complete. What we need you to do is complete. Father, and so we ask that we would worship you today as we're reminded of the great work of salvation you have accomplished for us. Lord, I, I pray that we would, not, we would not in any way think that our, our attempt to worship you is somehow earning our salvation. Lord, if there's sin in our lives from this past week that we have carried in here today, Father, far be it from us to think that we can somehow perform some good deed of worship that will make up for the sin, Lord, that we have committed this past week. Father, the only thing we can do with our sin is lay it at your feet and ask for your forgiveness based on the blood of Christ. And then, and then do a good work of worship, not to earn your love, but out of thankfulness and gratitude to you, the one who has loved us enough to rescue us even in the midst of our sin. So Father, we confess today that we are sinners. 
Father, we depend upon what Christ has done on the cross. Not on what we may attempt to do for you. Father, we are grateful to be your people. We're grateful to be the family of God. Lord, I pray for those in our church family who may be sick, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Father, I pray that you would watch over them. Father, those who are dealing with the effects of living in a broken world, Father, maybe there's pain, maybe there's suffering, maybe there's sorrow, maybe there's emotional turmoil, Father, maybe there's relational turmoil, Father, maybe there's sin struggles. Father, we ask that you would watch over every single one of us. All of our church family, Lord, we need you. We need you to encourage us. We need you to challenge us. We need you to be patient with us. We need you to love us. Father, we need you to walk with us. We need you to never leave us nor forsake us. We need you to sustain us moment by moment, day by day. And Father, as you do that, Lord, we want to serve you. We want to live our lives as an offering of worship to you, being obedient to the commission to which you have called us to make known the name of Christ, this name that is above every name, this name um, apart from which there is no salvation. Father, we want to make known this name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords to all the earth. Lord, we want those who live next to us and those who live thousands of miles away from us to know this Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so, Father, as we come into this time of the preaching of your word, Father, may you use your heart, you use your word to mold and shape our hearts into the exactly, into exactly the people that you want us to be, living here in this world, being in this world but not being of this world, being a part of this world as humanity, but living in such a way that others can see that we don't belong to this world. Father, because our citizenship is in heaven. And so we live to serve our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, would you use your word, use your spirit at work in us today to accomplish your purposes. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you're thinking that the next words out of my mouth are open up to the book of Psalms, you are correct. You are correct. Please open up in your Bible to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8 is going to be where we're at this morning. This text of God's word, probably a psalm that is familiar to you. One that perhaps you have even memorized some or all of. Perhaps you have sang the words of this psalm before. Psalm chapter 8. The title of our message today is Perfecting Humanity. Perfecting Humanity. We're going to begin by reading from God's Word. This is the very Word of the Most High God. Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Anyone like the game show Jeopardy? Anybody like that game show? Yeah, I see a lot of you. All right, cool, cool. I don't. I'm not good at it. <laughs> I can't think that quickly. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think quickly like that. I like to spend time thinking about my answer to something. It's too, it goes too fast for me. 
Well, Jeopardy is a trivia game where the contestants are given the answer, and then they have to give the question, right? That's how the game works. They get the answer, but then the answer they give is actually the question to the answer or, or the clue. For instance, if the answer or, or the clue, as it's called, is this, four legs sheds its hair and thinks the world revolves around its owner, then the correct response would be, what is a dog? There you go. You know it. You know it. Or, let me give you another one. Four legs sheds its hair and thinks the world revolves around it. What is a cat? There you go. All right. You know how to play the game. That, that's it. Those are pretty easy, uh, easy uh, answers or questions, however you want to word it. Let me give you one more clue. Let me give you another clue and see if you can give the correct response. Let me give you a hint. The question, which is the answer, remember, the question is in the psalm that we just read. Now, here's the clue. Holds a special place in God's creation for the purpose of magnifying the majesty of God. I'll say it one more time. Holds a special place in God's creation for the purpose of magnifying the majesty of God. The correct response is, what is man? What is man? Mankind, humanity. That is the question before us today. What is man? Now, it's not just in our minds, but it is in the mind of David, this question, as he writes Psalm 8. But these are not just merely David's words, these are God's word. And so we have before us today a psalm in which God poses this question for us and answers this age-old question, what is man? Now, I believe we could summarize Psalm 8 in this way, and that's with the clue that I just gave you. Humanity holds a special place in God's creation for the purpose of magnifying the majesty of God. Humanity holds a special place in God's creation for the purpose of magnifying the majesty of God. All those words there are, are important. We're talking about humanity. We hold a special place, and we'll talk about that place that we hold in God's creation. We're still a part of God's creation. We're not outside of His creation. We're not, we're not something other than His creation. We are His creation, but we hold a special place in His creation, and we have a unique purpose in that. Our purpose in holding that position is that we would magnify the majesty of God. Now, we're in a series of sermons in which we're looking at some of the overarching uh, topics of theology. We are looking at them um, from the perspective of the Psalms. And two weeks ago, we studied Psalm 19, and we learned some things about the doctrine of revelation. That is how God reveals himself to us. And last week, we studied this magnificent Psalm, Psalm chapter 90, and we learned some incredible truths uh, that I, they're still trying to sink into my heart and mind. Some truths about the doctrine of God. We saw that God is eternal, wrathful, and compassionate. Now today, we turn our attention to the doctrine of man. The teaching about humanity. And we're going to look at this uh, from the perspective of Psalm chapter 8. Now, when we say the doctrine of man, that's not to say that we have left God behind. In fact, every doctrine of Scripture centers upon God. And so we shouldn't be surprised today that we learn when we learn things about God as we are trying to learn things about ourselves, about humanity. The truth is we can't talk about man correctly without talking about God. We can't study man correctly without studying God. We can't understand man without understanding God, at least as much as a human mind is capable of understanding an infinite God. I want to share with you four truths from Psalm chapter 8 this morning that I pray will accurately reflect this text of Scripture and I pray will lead us to live for the glory of God as we understand ourselves accurately. And what I mean by that is understand ourselves from God's perspective. Truth number one I want to share with you this morning is this. Acknowledging God's majesty is the starting place for understanding humanity. Acknowledging God's majesty is the starting place for understanding humanity. We see this in verses 1 and 2. Now, Psalm chapter 8 is, is, is really one of the hallmark passages of Scripture when it comes to the study of mankind. And when you, when you pose this question, what does the Bible teach about man? And you were to list out three or four or five uh, key passages of Scripture, Psalm chapter 8 would be one of those passages. I didn't have to spend hours and hours searching for this passage of Scripture as I was considering the doctrine of man. At the center of this psalm, the question is posed, what is man? This is a psalm about humans. It's right to say that. 
And yet, I think it is very telling when we see that this psalm, which seems to center around the question, what is man, begins and ends with a repeated verse, which has very little to do with us as humans and an enormous amount to do with God. I think that should tell us something. Verse 1 says, remember, this is a psalm asking the question, what is man? And it begins, and it ends this way. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The only thing this verse says about humans is that we are servants of Yahweh. That's all it says. It does mention us, our our Lord, our God, okay? It does mention us, but the only thing it says about us at the beginning and end of this psalm is that we are servants of Yahweh God. The second word, Lord, is the word for master. The first word, Lord, is in all caps. It's God's name, Yahweh. Yahweh is Lord, is master. David addresses the God of this universe as the master, the ruler of humanity, and he immediately directs our attention to the worthiness of God to be worshipped. Yahweh, our Lord, is majestic in all the earth. You see there it says your name. Your name is majestic. When, when you see that name, it's not just talking about the letters of God's name are majestic. Somehow there's some special, special letters or something like that. What, what it means is God's name and all that encompasses God. Right? Your name stands for who you are. God's name stands for who he is. When he says your name is majestic, he's referring to all that is God. His holiness, his righteousness, his omnipotence, his sovereignty, his omniscience, his steadfast love, his wrath, his omnipresence, his eternal nature, his mercy. His name stands for him. He is majestic. He is beautiful and powerful and awe-inspiring. Our Lord, the Lord God of this universe is majestic. But where? Where is he majestic? Just in the tabernacle? Just in the temple? Just in Jerusalem? Just in Israel? No. Verse 1 says, in all the earth. Which means there is nowhere man lives that God is not majestic. Which tells us that all humanity is held responsible for declaring the majesty of God. For ascribing to him the glory that is due his name. Which is all glory, honor, and praise. But then the psalmist points us to two ways in which we see that God is majestic, that he's worthy to be worshipped in all the earth. At first, we see God's majesty in, in his position of glory. God's majesty is seen in his position of glory. We see this at the end of verse 1. Okay, so we're still on main truth number 1. But we see two ways that God is majestic. God's majesty is seen in the position of his glory. The end of verse 1 says, you have set your glory above the heavens. You have set your glory above the heavens. God's glory, God's majesty, God's worthiness to be worshipped is above the heavens. And we talked about what the heavens are a couple of weeks ago when we studied Psalm chapter 19. The heavens are what you see when you walk outside and you look up. Friends, you can launch yourself into outer space and just keep going and going and going and you would never reach the point where you have to look down to see the glory of God. You have set your glory above the heavens. The God who created the heavens has set his glory above the heavens. The position of his glory tells us that he is, and he alone is majestic in all the earth. But then secondly, we see God's majesty displayed another way. God's majesty is seen in the manner of his victory. God's majesty is seen in the manner of his victory. We see this in verse 2 of this psalm. Verse 2 says this, a unique verse. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. That's, that's, that that kind of makes you scratch your head for a second. I mean, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glories above the heavens, your glory above the heavens. And then he starts talking about babies and infants and enemies and foes and strength over the enemies. Or what, what in the world is going on here? Uh, Much could be said about this verse. I I don't want to spend all of our time on this one verse today, so I'm going to try to put it to you as as briefly as I can. Verse 2 is telling us that the God whose glory is above the heavens, so think, it's really powerful, right? Is so powerful that he can take the weakest humans, that is babies and infants, and defeat his enemy with those. That's his army. That's, that's, that's all he needs. He can take the weakest, uh, weakest uh, humans, babies and infants, and defeat his 
enemy. God displays his strength by taking what is weak and bringing to nothing those who consider themselves stronger than God. This is what it means to be an enemy of God. You, you're putting yourself in the place of God. You're saying that, that I, I, I am more powerful than the Lord. It's what it means to be an enemy of God. Jesus quoted the Greek translation of this verse on Palm Sunday. Very interesting here. Jesus quoted the Greek translation of this verse. Remember, Old Testament written in Hebrew, but it was translated into Greek. Um, and, and, and so he quoted the Greek translation in, in, on Palm Sunday. In Matthew chapter 21, we see that little children were crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, right? We often think about the, the, the palm branches on the road coming into Jerusalem, but they went into the, te- into the temple, Scripture says. And so there in the temple, you have all these little children crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, they're, they're praying, they're speaking about Jesus as the son of David. So they're praising Jesus, these little children in the temple, praising this, this man who just rode in on a donkey. Matthew chapter 21, verse um, uh, 16, um, after, telling, after Scripture says that the chief priests and the scribes were furious when, when they heard these children, verse 16 says, and they said to him, talking to Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? Do you hear what these little, these little children are saying, Jesus? I mean, they're worshiping you. That's what they were doing. They're worship- and, and the chief priests, were, that's blasphemy, right? He, you only worship God. And here these little children are, are worshiping you, Jesus. Do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said to them, out of the mouth of infants and nur- nursing babies, you have prepared praise. That's the Greek translation of of this Hebrew verse. He quotes Psalm chapter 8 to them. You know what Jesus is saying? (laughs) Jesus is saying this, these little ones are right and you are wrong. They are praising me and you are rejecting me. They are on the side of divine victory and you are on the side of divine wrath. You think you are powerful. You think you are strong. You think you are wise, but God uses the weak to shame the strong and the foolish to, to shame the wise. God's ways are higher than your ways and God's thoughts higher than your thoughts. God will use the praise of these little ones to silence the rage of the serpent himself and all who oppose God. That's what Jesus was telling those chief priests. You say, that probably made him even even more mad. Yeah, it did. So mad that just a few days later, they hung him on a cross. Now back to Psalm chapter 8. Do you you see the point here in verse 2? Who is more powerful and worthy of worship? Is it the warrior who can defeat an army with a water gun? Or is it the warrior who needs an arsenal of explosives? Well, we would probably say it's the one who all he needs is a water gun. That's going to be the more powerful one, right? Say, ah, that's all I need. That's the more powerful one. Opposed to the one who says, I got to have all these weapons because I'm not very strong, so I need all of these other weapons. That's what the the point here, that's what this verse 2 is saying. Psalmist is saying God can win with simply the praise of babies and infants. (laughs) That's all he needs to silence his enemies. He is that majestic, David is saying. And so God's majesty is seen in the position of his glory and in the manner of his victory. Church, I'm going to spend some of our time, a good bit of our time on this verse here today because it's so important. It's so foundational. This is huge. The psalm, the uh, psalm about man begins and ends with a laser focus on God, not man, being majestic in all the earth. This psalm about who we are begins and ends with a shout of praise to the one true God, not with a shout of praise to us. This psalm, which helps us understand who we are, begins and ends by turning our gaze away from ourselves and fixing our eyes and our hearts and our minds upon the majesty of God. Oh, how this is needed in our sinful hearts. Oh, how this is needed in a society which seeks to understand man by beginning and ending with man. Far too often we think we are the centerpiece of the world. We applaud arrogance on the political stage. We applaud arrogance in the science laboratory. We we applaud arrogance at the classroom lectern. We think we know ourselves best when we begin and end with ourselves. But church, that is the talk of fools. We want to know ourselves. We don't start with ourselves, nor do we end with ourselves. Perhaps the most foundational statement one can make regarding the biblical doctrine of humanity is that 
anthropology, that's the study of man, begins and ends with theology. <laughs> that is the study of God. The study of mankind begins and ends with the study of God, and this is true because we exist for the glory of the one who created us. Church, if our study of mankind does not result in worship of God, then we have failed in our attempt to study mankind. Or to say it another way, any understanding of mankind which does not result in worship of God is a misunderstanding. It doesn't matter how smart the person claims to be or how many degrees they have or what position in this world they hold. If our understanding of humanity does not lead us to worship the one true God, then it is a misunderstanding of who we are. It's not wrong to ask the question, who am I? Who are we? What is man? It's not wrong to study ourselves, but as we study ourselves, we must be aware of the danger of replacing God with ourselves. If nothing else, the opening and closing of this psalm should lead us to study ourselves in a way that glorifies the creator rather than the creation. We are not God. We are not God. And so first, acknowledging God's majesty is a starting place for understanding humanity. Now we move into exploring who who are we? (laughs) What is man? What is humankind? Truth number two I want to share with you is this. Humanity is cared for by God, though we seem insignificant. Humanity is cared for by God, though we seem insignificant. Verses three through four, we find the psalmist gazing up into the heavens, recognizing how small he seems in comparison, and then pondering the amazing fact that the God whose glory is far above the heavens is mindful of them and cares for them, for him in particular, and for all of humanity. Verse 3 through 4 says this, when I look at your heavens, I've got to imagine this, looking up, looking up into the, to the starry night sky. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Perhaps here we get a glimpse of David the shepherd boy lying on his back out in the fields at night while he's watching over the sheep. Perhaps he tried to count the stars. Perhaps he pondered the waxing and waning of the moon. Perhaps he tried to guess how big the heavens were. I'm not sure. But we, what we do know from these verses is that when he looked up into the heavens, number one, he believed God created the heavens. Notice he says that they are the work of your fingers. And that God set them in place. And two, he felt very small, very insignificant compared to the heavens. He believed that God created the heavens, and he, David, felt very small and insignificant compared to the heavens. I think David was right on both accounts. Certainly Yahweh created the heavens along with the rest of creation. They did not come into being because of the work of some other god or goddess invented by man, which many people around him believe. They did not come into being because of some evolutionary process which modern man seems to think is the only reasonable explanation for their existence. This is what people all around us believe. They were there, they are there because of the creative working of God. And this is important, church, because if God is not the creator of the heavens and of us, then we are left with viewing ourselves as either gods or dogs. Either worthy of worship or possessing no more value than the flea on a monkey's back. But that's not what Scripture tells us about who we are. And friends, we see both of these false views of mankind today. Some act and live as though there were no one higher in the world to answer to than themselves, puffed up with pride and arrogance, thinking that they are the master of their own universe. And some act and live as though humans can be treated like an ant, You can snuff out human life and go about your merry way with zero remorse as to what you have done. Certainly that's an arrogant proposition as well. Again, this is why it's so important that we start with God when studying ourselves. Because if we don't, we either end up deifying ourselves or destroying ourselves. If we don't start with God as creator, sovereign, majestic one on all the earth, then we will end up deifying ourselves, making ourselves God, or we will end up destroying ourselves. 
because we'll think that we're worthless. We have zero value. We're just another, another part in the evolutionary process. Ironically, both of those actually are not mutually exclusive. They often go hand in hand. This psalm corrects both our undervaluing and our overvaluing of mankind. Looking at verse 4, we see that David not only believed God created the heavens, he felt very insignificant compared to the heavens. He says, what are you, what is man, excuse me, that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Have you ever looked up at the stars on a clear night? It's beautiful, right? You ever looked up and felt very small? I have. I have. You look up in the vastness and we, I mean, just with the, with the naked eye, we can only see what we can see and put a telescope in front of your eye you can see even further but we still can't even see all of the heavens we feel very small sometimes we need to do that (laughs) sometimes that's a healthy thing to do we need the vastness of the heavens to humble us but David's question in verse 4 goes deeper than simply feeling small his feeling of insignificance seems to butt heads with his awareness that God knows him and cares for him and David is left a little puzzled right He feels like God should ignore him because he's so small. David is so small, not God. David is so small. But he knows that God doesn't ignore him. David has experienced God's providential care in his life. We don't know exactly at what point in his life David wrote this psalm, but we know that from a very young age, David experienced God's care in his life. God protected him from the wild animals when he was a shepherd boy. God protected David from Goliath when he went out to fight this giant among men. God protected David from Saul's spear in Saul's house and Saul's army in the rocks of En Gedi. David was very aware of God's very real mindfulness and care. And yet, he says, I'm so small. I'm nothing, God. But what is man that you are so mindful of him, that you care for him? As David wrote in Psalm chapter 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. And later in that same psalm, he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. Friend, the same God, The same God who set the moon and the stars in place, fashioned and formed you in your mother's womb. It's not just the heavens which are the work of God's fingers. You are as well. You have value. Though we are small, we have value. In the eyes of God, we are valuable. And yet when we don't come at humanity from this perspective what we're left with is thinking that humanity whether in the womb or outside of the womb can simply be destroyed it's dangerous when we study ourselves and neglect the God who made us but you don't simply have the same value to God as the moon and stars or even the birds or the fish or the animals church God has value for those. Even Jesus talked about providing food for the, for the little birds, and clothing the, the flower in the field with splendor, beauty. God values all of creation, but he doesn't value us the same as he values the rest of creation. Friends, we have far more value in God's eyes than the moon and the stars or even the birds or the fish or the animals on the land. And it's exactly where the psalmist goes next. Humanity is cared for by God, though we seem insignificant. But third, humanity is in a position of privilege, though we are still part of creation. Humanity is in a position of privilege, though we are still part of creation. You see the balance. You see this tightrope that we're walking here. God cares for us, but we are very small. So you have value, but don't think too highly of yourself. You are still small. Here, humanity is in a position of privilege. We have this amazing value that God, our creator, has placed upon us. But don't forget, we're still part of creation. We're not God. We're still part of creation. 
Verses 5 through 8 are incredible verses. The psalmist is answering the question, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? He gets into the answer to this question in verses 5 through 8. The reason God cares so much for humanity is that humanity is not just another part of creation equal to the rest of creation. Humanity is not just another species of animals. We are not simply the next link in a long chain of an evolutionary process. That is not the case at all. These verses are simply a poetic reflection upon the opening chapters of the Bible, which tell us that we as humans are the pinnacle of God's creation, and we are set apart from the rest of creation. But lest we begin to think too highly of ourselves, these verses also remind us that we are still a part of creation. We are not God. Any special privileges we have, notice verses 5 through 8, are ours because God gave them to us. Not because we earned them or took them by force. Notice the two ways in which we're set apart from the rest of creation. Verse 5 says, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. First way that we see that we're set apart from the rest of creation is this. For God's glory, we are crowned with glory. For God's glory, we are crowned with glory. This verse says, verse 5 says that God has made man in a privileged position. The word heavenly beings here could also be translated God, depending on the context. It's not extremely clear which way it should be translated. And the Greek translation, which is quoted in the New Testament, the meaning is heavenly beings or angels. But regardless of how you translate that, the point is very clear. Humans have been given a privileged position. We have been crowned with glory and honor. Now, this is incredible here. Think about the word glory. We've already seen this word glory in this psalm. We've already seen it. Remember verse 1? You have set your glory above the heavens. In verse 1, God is said to be the glorious one. So how then can David turn around and say that humans have been crowned with glory and honor? Well, the the answer lies in God's account of creation in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Skipping ahead, goes on to say, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Listen, humans are made in the image of God. God is glorious, and so it makes sense then that he has crowned humanity with glory, those made in his image with glory and honor. One of the ways we see the rejection of this biblical worldview in our society is the overvaluing of animals and even plants alongside the undervaluing of human life. Think about it. We give millions and millions of dollars to pet shelters while people go hungry and homeless. We cry when we see a cat run over on the side of the road and then try to pretend the homeless person isn't there. We chain ourselves to trees to keep them from being cut down, but then turn around and say it's okay to murder a human life in the womb. Now, I'm in no way saying we should ignore plants and animals. In fact, we're going to see in just a moment that we have a great responsibility (laughs) when it comes to plants and animals and the rest of creation. However, Only humans have been crowned with glory and honor. Only humans have been made in the image of God. When the psalmist says that we have been made a little lower than the heavenly beings, the point is that we have been given a position much higher than the rest of creation. But remember how the psalm begins and ends. God is worthy of all glory. And so the glory with which he has crowned us, the privileged position with which he has made us, is ultimately for his glory and not his ours and so for god's glory we are crowned with glory and the second way we see here that that we have a privileged position is this under god's rule we rule over creation under god's rule we rule over creation Again, remember we're walking this tightrope where we don't want to make ourselves god we're under god's rule but we have this incredible privilege and responsibility we rule over creation our privileged position is also seen in the responsibility that god has given us look at verses six through eight you have given him mankind dominion over the works of your hands you have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field and birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea whatever passes along the paths of the seas 
You see, one aspect of being made in the image of God is that we have been given responsibility to rule like God. Not to rule as God, but to rule like God. All the rest of creation has been placed under humanity and is to be ruled by humanity. Again, David is simply commenting on the creation account found in Genesis. In the same context in which God said he was going to make man in his own image, God also said this, and let them, talking about humans, have dominion. That's rulership. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Humanity has been given the responsibility of stewarding creation. We are to manage creation. We are to use creation for our good, such as using creation for our shelter and for our food and for our clothing. We are to care for creation in such a way that future generations can enjoy and have a creation to manage and steward over as well. But remember, we're not God. We rule, but we only rule under God's rule. We didn't come in like a conquering king and set up our rule over creation. Instead, we have been given this responsibility of exercising dominion by God. We didn't put all things under our feet. Instead, God has done the pudding. We will answer to him for how we have ruled over creation. We are to rule over creation as we submit to his rule. But the main point here is that we as humans do have a privileged position compared to the rest of creation. Now, remember the first and the last statements of this psalm. God is majestic in all the earth. This is the context in which humanity is understood correctly, which means God's care for us and the privileged position he has given us is meant to point to how majestic he is. And yet, there's a problem here. This perfect picture of humanity. There's nothing bad in Psalm 8, right? Psalm, Psalm 8 is one of those passages of Scripture. There's nothing bad there. It doesn't talk about sin. It doesn't talk about the fall. It's, it's, it's all good. And yet, this perfect picture of humanity we see in Psalm 8 does not seem to line up with what we see in our world today. I mean, it seems as though the psalm should end like this. But Adam and Eve sinned, and humanity has been cursed, and they don't acknowledge God as their creator who is worthy of worship, and they don't consider God's care for them, and they don't rule over creation in a way that magnifies the glory of God. We expect a statement telling us that perfect humanity is not perfect. And yet the psalm ends the same way it began, with a declaration of the majesty of Yahweh, our Lord. Now, how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of this? Well, let me share with you one final truth, which I believe will help us understand how imperfect humanity can still reflect the majesty of God. Church, God's majesty is displayed most magnificently in his rescue of humanity. God's majesty is displayed most magnificently in his rescue of humanity. The truth is that we have failed at this perfect picture of humanity. We are not the humanity God originally created. We think we are bigger than we actually are. We reject God's care. We are not satisfied with the position God has given us, so we try to take God's position. We abuse our rule over creation either by letting creation rule us or by misusing creation. We fall short of the glory of God. We are sinners. But the good news is that this psalm is not only about humanity as a whole, but it is about one particular human. This psalm, church, is about Jesus, the God-man, the only human who has ever perfectly lived up to God's design for humanity. Where we fall short, Jesus excelled. In several places in the New Testament, Psalm 8 is either quoted or referenced as describing Jesus Christ. This is awesome. Let me share with you one of those passages. It's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Listen to what the New Testament says. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, and we know where. 
What is man that you are mindful of him? I'm reading out of the New Testament, by the way. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, the writer of Hebrews is going to explain Psalm 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now this is a thick passage, but let me explain it as simply as I know how. Hebrews chapter 2 is telling us that Psalm chapter 8 is a perfect description of humanity pointing to the perfect human. It describes us perfectly except that we are sinners it describes jesus perfectly with no exception because jesus never sinned you see jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of psalm 8 where adam as a representative of humanity failed jesus as a representative of humanity excelled that passage in Hebrews tells us that Jesus, who is fully God, clothed himself with humanity, becoming a little lower than the angels, and through his death was crowned with glory and honor. The Son of God became human in order to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. He tasted death for you and for me. He experienced God's wrath towards our failure to live up to God's perfect design for humanity. And therefore, as, this song, as, as Hebrews chapter 2 says... By God's grace, we can be rescued from God's wrath. You see, church, God's majesty is displayed through his design of humanity, but his majesty is displayed most magnificently through his rescue of humanity. Psalm chapter 8, when interpreted based on the rest of, rest of Scripture, is teaching us this, that humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation, and Jesus is the pinnacle of humanity. Humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation, and Jesus is the pinnacle of humanity. The first part of verse 5 was fulfilled in the incarnation of Jesus. That is, when Jesus was born as a human. The second part of verse 5 in Psalm 8 was fulfilled when the crucified Jesus became the resurrected Jesus. He was crowned with glory and honor, taking his place at the right hand of God. And verse 6 is being fulfilled and will be finally fulfilled when Jesus returns destroys Satan and those who belong to him once and for all and is enthroned forever as the conquering king of kings and lord of lords. This is the gospel of Jesus. Friends, you can be rescued through Jesus, the perfect human who died in your place. And this is the only way, church, that we can live out our true purpose as humans. It is only through Jesus that we can bring glory to God. It is only through Jesus that we, as sinful humans, can say, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Friends, we cannot study ourselves without starting with God as the majestic creator and ending with God as the majestic redeemer. God made humans perfect. We messed it up. But through Jesus, God is perfecting humanity, one rescued soul at a time. So let me ask you a question. Do you need to be rescued today? so you need to repent of your sin by confessing it to God you need to believe in Jesus as the only one that can save you because he is the only perfect sacrifice for your sin will you believe in Jesus or will you live for the majesty of God Heavenly Father I thank you for this incredible song Lord it leads us to long to be perfect God, it leaves us hungering to be like this humanity described in Psalm 8 because, God, we know we're not like that, not, not left to ourselves. We've messed it all up. But, God, you have displayed your glory so magnificently by redeeming sinful humanity through your perfect son who became a human and is the only one who ever lived perfectly as a human. So, Father, all praise and glory and honor goes to King Jesus. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth.
God, would you be pleased as we respond by worshiping you through song? Would you receive these praises as pleasing to your ears, as a humble offering of worship to you, God, the one and only one who is majestic in all the earth? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together as we sing this morning. In light of Jesus, we fall down, we lay our crowns at his feet. Psalm 146 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. But happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. 
who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's sing 10,000 reasons.
Let's end our time together today worshiping the Lord by singing the psalm that we just studied. You know this chorus. Let's sing it out to the Lord. Majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty Don't forget, next week, one service at 10 o'clock in the Family Life Center. And don't forget, next week is the time change. So, got two time changes to remember for next week. Uh, may the Lord watch over us and keep us as we go from this place.